Hello, welcome to our first three-part series on Muslims in Brooklyn, using archives to foster civic engagement. My name is Shirley Brown Eileen, and I'm the manager of the Center for Brooklyn History. Today, I'm joined by my fellow colleagues from the education team at CBH, as well as our speakers, oral historian Zahir Ali, educator Emily Paran Njai, and curriculum author Alex Stronalo. I'd like to commence the official proceedings of today's session by acknowledging the Center for Brooklyn's History stand on land that is part of the unceded ancestral homeland of the Lenape Delaware people. Let's get to know each other. Um, we'd like to actually ask you a couple of polls. So the first poll is, where are you joining us from? Brooklyn, Bronx, Manhattan, Queens, Staten Island, elsewhere in the tri-state or elsewhere in the United States? Or abroad? Okay, it looks like we have primarily people from Brooklyn, 60% the Bronx, 9% Manhattan, 9% Queens, and 9% elsewhere in the area. Next question. Okay. What grade levels do you teach? Elementary, middle, high school? Are you from a museum or cultural institution or other? Okay, it looks like we have 46% is from elementary, 8% middle, 15% high, high school, 8% museum cultural institutions, and 23% other. Great. Next question. ELA, all of the above, visual performing arts, or other? percent histories, 14% year, and all of the above, and 50% other. Next question, have you used oral histories in the classroom before? Oh, so about 29% of you, 1% of you say no. This will definitely be a very enlightening session for you because oral histories are really great to use in the classroom. Thank you for participating in our poll. We do appreciate it. Okay. Our agenda for tonight is first, of course, we're doing our welcome. 405, Muslims in Brooklyn, Pillars of the Project was a year Ali. 425, Oral Histories in the Classroom with Emily Potter and Jai. Thing and Blackout Poetry Activity with Alex Tronalone. And then we'll have our wrap up about 525. Our objectives today is for educators to gain an insight into diverse experiences, take away lessons for incorporating culturally relevant perspectives into curriculum, as well as, uh, as well as other resources. Please feel free to look at the booklet that we have linked in the chat and that you may have been sent earlier today for more resources about this topic. CTLE credit. At the end of today's workshop, we're going to share a link for you to complete. Once you have completed that link, then we will send you information to credit if you'd like. Virtual housekeeping. If you um, would like to go to your name, hover over your name, do a right click, and then you can be able to change your name, be able to add your pronouns. He, she, he, him, she, her, he, whichever one that you prefer. Please use the chat feature to answer questions. 
um, and um, you can do that as our speakers are speaking, and we will answer questions as soon as we can. Accessibility. If you we have the closed caption, which is available during today's session and can be, can be enabled by clicking on the CC closed caption icon on the bottom of the window. Lastly, we want you to be aware that this session is being recorded and will be shared after the session concludes. Please remember the code of conduct agreed upon when you registered for this workshop. By participating with your camera on, you have consented to be recorded. If you do not consent to be to being recorded, please turn your camera off and refrain frame from verbally sharing ideas, comments, and questions. You can share these through the chat feature, which will not be saved. I would uh, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our speakers. First, Zahir Ali, who is the inaugural executive director of the Hutchins Center for Race and Social Justice at the Lawrenceville School in New Jersey. It is an innovative secondary school initi initiative supporting social justice teaching and practice through scholarship, programming, and experiential learning. He was the project manager for Muslims in Brooklyn and Columbia University's Malcolm X Project. He also is a co-producer for Flatbush in Maine, Brooklyn Historical Society's award-winning monthly broadcast, which explored Brooklyn's past and present through scholarly discussions, historical archives, and oral histories. In addition, he is an executive producer of American Muslims, A History Revealed, a national endowment for the humanities-funded digital film series and feature-length broadcast documentary currently in production. Emily Potter Ninjai leads museum programs that leverage history, art, and cultural heritage to spark and conceptual and contextualize meaningful contemporary dialogue. Currently, the Dwight and Christian Polar and Andrew W. Mellon, head of education and curator of academic programs at the Mead Art Museum at Amherst College. She oversees student and faculty engagement through class visits, student employment, internship mentoring, public program. Previously, she was the outstanding director of education at Brooklyn Historical Society during the early phases of the Muslims in Brooklyn project. Emily has also worked as an educator at the Contemporary Jewish Museum in San Francisco, the New York Historical Society, and institution Mark Perot in, in Dakar, Senegal. Emily is here. Thank you both for participating with us today. If you'd like to start your talk with a question, well, please begin. Thank you so much for having us, um, uh, Shirley. And um, this is a little bit of a reunion for many of us because we all were, work together at uh, Brooklyn Historical Society. And so it's really great to come back and share and see that the work that we did still has legs and um, continues to have an impact, which was what our desire was. Um, I will talk a little bit about the project and how we conceived of the project and how we organize um, the collection of oral histories for the project and, and why, why we took the approach that we did before passing it on to Emily. So first, um, the project was premised on three very basic ideas. And I say basic because they could pretty much apply uh, in the United States, which is why it's so, I think, uh, translates so well. The first is that Muslims have a long history in Brooklyn, in New York City, and in the United States. And um, we know that a significant number or portion of enslaved people who are brought to the Americas came from predominantly Muslim parts of West Africa, that slavery was present in New York City and in Brooklyn. We also know that the records of those enslaved people um, were not the best kind of archival records, and so many of them have um, sort of disappeared or their records of their lives have been hard to reconstruct when we, we, we think about the archives. We also know there was a, a gentleman named Van Zali who was of mixed Moorish descent, who was one of the first landowners uh, during the Dutch period in Brooklyn's history in the Coney Island era. area. And so um, how much of his 
identity as a Muslim played a part in his experiences in the 17th century is not so. The idea that, again, is that um, the history of Muslims in the United States and Brooklyn extends well beyond the founding of the nation. The second premise is that Muslims in Brooklyn constitute diverse communities, that there isn't any one singular profile, ethnic, uh, uh, racial, nationality, um, even denomination or, or, or tradition that you could use to say, this is what a Muslim looks like. And in Brooklyn, we have that diversity. And the third premise was that Muslims are integral to Brooklyn and have been integral to the life of the borough, that Muslims have shaped how Brooklyn developed over time and have similarly been shaped uh, by the forces that have influenced other and shaped other peoples in, um, in the borough. So long history, diverse community and integral roles. So with the, that premise or with those premises, we then organized our oral histories around four themes. Uh, we thought about highlighting narratives that um, would illustrate these themes. And the first theme was migrations. And migrations we meant, by migrations, we meant um, both physical and spiritual migrations. Uh, stories of people who moved to Brooklyn from other parts of the country, from other parts of the world, stories of people who left Brooklyn, uh, stories of people who moved from one neighborhood to another neighborhood within New York City and within Brooklyn. And also stories of people who spiritually migrated towards the tradition of Islam and also migrated away from the tradition of, of, of Islam. So there is a sense of movement there. The second theme is formations. We looked at or wanted to listen for the kinds of community and cultural, uh, community institutions and cultural formations that people established once they settled to Brooklyn. So we looked at mosques and bookstores and businesses and schools and uh, religious practices around rituals like uh, of, uh, occasions like weddings and the ho holy days. And so formations was the second theme. The third theme was geographies, looking at how neighborhood change and development, including gentrification, were factors in the lives of the people that we interviewed. Uh, and this meant people were impacted by gentrification and neighborhood change and development. And sometimes it also meant that they were responsible for that neighborhood change and development. Uh, and so it has always been a two-way kind of process. The fourth theme was engagement. Um, both the kinds of formal civic engagement that people would engage in politically through electoral politics, but also through protest and, and community organizing. And then finally, the fifth uh, theme was creativity, looking at the role of Muslims uh, in Brooklyn in the art scene, whether that is photography, writing, visual arts, music, and so forth. So with those four, I'm sorry, with those five themes, we organized uh, to collect oral histories. Now, the reason why we chose Brooklyn was, of course, um, at the time I lived in Brooklyn, I was a Muslim in Brooklyn. <laughs> so there was that immediate connection, but we were at the Center for Brooklyn History at then called Brooklyn Historical Society. So there was an institutional imperative, I think, to, to look at Brooklyn. Uh, we also knew by looking around the archives that we had that there, didn't, there weren't many stories of Muslims. Um, and so it was really important for people who are familiar with oral histories that one of the ways that oral histories uh, developed as a, a plan uh, has been to address the silence and erasure of people in the archives. And so it was really important for us to do that. But Brooklyn is unique. You know, we, I used to joke that we were um, sort of Brooklyn exceptionalists. Like there was something unique and special about Brooklyn that um, made all of our work especially meaningful. And this was true in the case of Muslims in Brooklyn. Um, Brooklyn has uh, one of the oldest Muslim communities in the country, uh, founded in 1907, the Lithuanian Tatar community, um, founded the American Mohammedan Society, and in 1931, they purchased a building in Williamsburg, which is one of the oldest continuous mosque structures uh, in the country. So that's, Brooklyn can claim that. 
Um, what is, what's interesting is that this, this building was once a church, then a Democratic Party club meeting house, and then a mosque. And that's just very typical New York, but also very typical Brooklyn, how the same, same space gets used for different purposes and changes as a result of that. Uh, Brooklyn also had a mosque that was founded by Malcolm X in the 1960s. Uh, at the time that we commenced our project, there were over 100 houses of worship in uh, Muslim houses of worship in Brooklyn. Um, at the time, more than any other borough in New York City, I think maybe that's been eclipsed by Queens. They were sort of running neck and neck. But needless to say, there's significant uh, Muslim communities, a uh, number of communities in Brooklyn. But there were other reasons too. Um, there was a landmark uh, court case in 2017, Reza versus the New York City, uh, which looked at uh, police surveillance um, and led to significant uh, calls for reform on the ways police surveilled American citizens, in particular Muslims. And the plaintiffs in that landmark case um, were from Brooklyn. Um, we have in Brooklyn's Muslim communities artists, writers, activists, clergy, student organizers. And you know, we interviewed people like Linda Sarsour, who was one of the organize, organizers of the Women's March. We interviewed a Shahana Hanif before, when she was a community organizer who is now, um, will be in January sworn in as the first uh, South Asian woman in the city, New York City Council and the first Muslim in the New York City Council. So I, I think that we were pretty prescient in the way that we anticipated the significant role that Muslims in Brooklyn would play. Another significant person that we interviewed, and they, all the narrators were significant, So I, I, but I'm highlighting, so just to give you a sense, um, is the artist Mohammed Fayez, who is one of the organizers of the Poppy Juice Collective for uh, uh, queer and trans people of color. And he is, his, his work has significantly um, just sort of gone into the stratosphere in terms of the recognition of his work. And, and, and there are many other examples of that, uh, of why Muslims in Brooklyn was an important this project around. Um, just a, a few final notes before I hand over to Emily. And one of the things that was important for us was to approach this project without essentializing or exoticizing Muslims was to, you know, and I like to say that Muslim, being Muslim was a box, was not a box to put people in, but a box that people stood on. That that identity was important and foundational to the people that we interviewed, but it was not the summation and sum total of who they were. Uh, it did not explain everything about them. So it's always important to think about when we think about identity, that identity is a touchstone. It isn't, you know, a fully enclosing uh, um, container. And, and then finally, um, we balanced content with methodology in the way that we conceived of this project. This We didn't set out to do like an Islam 101 or let's explain who Muslims are. Uh, we sort of took for granted that Muslims are who they are and wanted to um, embed them or, or show how they were of neighborhood, stories of traditions, stories of difference. And really, as we developed this project, um, the project was about listening and, and the values and ethics uh, around oral history. Um, and that really you could use those principles to build any project around any group or any uh, theme uh, that you choose. And so that was really important. And then finally, it was important to bring in artists uh, as we conceived of what to do with this project. And I think um, Emily is gonna talk a lot more about the, the role of artists because um, it was in conversations with Emily that we really started pulling together the ideas for how the arts could play a role, not only in how we thought about this collection, the exhibition that accompanied it, but also the educational programming. And, and all I'll just say is that, you know, oral histories are, archival sources, but they're also narratives and so constitute a kind of art. Um, Alessandra Patelli says like the, the art of, of listening is, you know, to, I'm paraphrasing, but the art of the oral historian is the art of listening. Um, and so it was really important for us to think about that we were producing narratives and 
um, you know, artists help us bring new and refreshing questions to things that we've been looking and listening to, listen, looking at and listening to for for many many cycles. And they challenge boundaries, they challenge linearity, they challenge categories. Um, they focus on questions rather than answers, and these are very much aligned with the sort of open ended inquiry that oral history is. And so with that, uh, I'm going to pass the baton to Emily um, to take us uh, further. Thank you, Zahir. Um, such a huge appreciation and thank you to be kind of in this Zoom space again with just so many dear colleagues Zahir, Alex, Shirley, Charlie. Um, and thanks to everyone at Center for Broken History for pulling this together. Um, and a big hello and kind of thank you to the teachers in the room. I think in the, I spent about 12 years in public history and museum education in New York City and um, got to, you know, work closely with so many New York City teachers and people, you know, in the surrounding areas and came to see you as the smartest, uh, most fierce and dedicated kind of leaders in the city. So it's an honor to get to spend some time with you on my computer screen. Um, I, Zahir pull out so many important things that kind of connect to what I what I wanted to speak to today. And um, you know, I did work on the project um, in its kind of earlier phases before I, I ended up leaving the city. And um, what I wanted to, I think I can speak to best is kind of what was guiding us as we took all of this juicy um, kind of oral history leadership from Zahir and thought about. Um, how it was going to play out for K-12 educators. Um, and so I'll talk about those kind of guide points, um, but before I do that, I want to also think about the topic of civics and belonging um, today, and so how we're influenced by the people who come before us, who are going to come after us, who live all around us. So I wanted to just take a moment also to share um, the threads of where I'm coming from today. Um, I live and work on Nanatuck land, which is um, the ancestral homeland and Nipmuc people. Their land is also part of the greater Quinnitequa or Connecticut River Valley, also known as Western Massachusetts, um, and really sits at the crossroads of other indigenous nations. So I also want to acknowledge the ancestry of neighboring lands, the Wampanoag to the east, um, the Mohegan and Pequot to the south, the Mohican to the west, and the Abenaki to the north. And we're talking about these topics of archival um, invisibility and the kind of limitations of um, the received, you know, or dominant histories. And so I think it's always important to acknowledge um, native lands. And also that's only like one step of the way towards um, some of the work that, that we need to do to tell better and fuller stories um, and to approach justice through any of these kind of um, ancillary worlds that we work in, whether it's museums, um, archives, education. So I also wanted to drop some links in to the chat for some of the local to me um, organizations that you can support and go to for more resources. Um, and now a little bit about my own threads. Charlie suggested how we came to this project personally. Um, and I almost never do that, but I, I think I can. And I'll tell you that, you know, I know that I show up in the world as a white um, American cisgender woman, kind of middle-aged these days, and um, that my own ancestors came here three or four generations ago as settler colonists um, and immigrants from Ireland, Lithuania. I was mostly raised in the West Coast household. My own parents having kind of moved away and made a choice, um, their own spiritual migration, I guess, from a Protestant background to Quaker. Um, move forward many years and I married into a Muslim family um, and then move forward many years from that and I decided to convert to Islam myself or begin a process of doing that I guess I think there's a lot of learning that goes into that. Um, I became a mom to two children who show up in the world quite differently than I ever have. They're multiracial and black, um, Muslim by birthright, born New Yorkers. Um, as a way of naming or claiming any kind of authority <laughs> to speak to anything or any credentials, um, not at all, but more because it helps me kind of think of the things that guide me on my own as I make sense of my own path, um, of my own family, 
which does include a spiritual migration to borrow Zahir's term, um, that kind of guided me to opening up a raft of meaningful historical questions um, that we might pose through this project um, and solidified for me also how this project is a history project um, for K-12. And so that kind of logic and intention of this theme of migrations, um, of formations, these helped us move into the direction of, well, what are some of the juicy, meaningful historical questions that we wanna ask through this project? And again, um, we weren't, we never set out to provide answers, we, but as educators who were gonna be bringing this into a curricular format, um, we kind of needed a proof of concept around what are the good questions to ask. And so through those lenses, we got to questions that are in the scope of a sequence, right? That um, we know kind of carry, carry a weight and currency and meaning um, for teaching in public schools around what does it mean to be an American? How has citizenship expanded and contracted for various groups over time? What does it mean to, be, to belong, to be in community in a multicultural city like Brooklyn or New York City? Um, how have faith communities organized and responded to social justice and movements at different points in history, right? So through all of this work, we were um, guided by our mission to, to do our part to build historical consciousness um, in students and children and in young people. And what we aimed um, to do, I guess, well, let me switch gears a little bit. I think we, we aim to do that and we're also challenged by some assumptions, right? Challenged by assumptions that um, this curriculum might sit in a, in a box called world history, right? That it might be contained within or, um, or one moment in, in a textbook when it was children's identities, right? That were gonna be um, touched upon um, people's stories and people's families in the classroom we're gonna come out um, maybe for the first time in some classrooms. And there's kind of an ethics to how we wanted to present that um, as the educators on the side of this project. So what did that look like? Part of what we were doing was, as Zahir mentioned, kind of shifting a narrative around Muslims in Brooklyn for all, the, all of the kind of points that he raised. Um, and this meant breaking down assumptions that um, this was going to be a story only about kind of post-1965 immigration, that it, we would challenge false equivalencies of religion and race. Um, we would center stories of Islam and Black America. Um, we would center the intersections of race um, and anti-Muslim violence and the range of Muslims in Brooklyn and really kind of keep in our minds and hold, hold, hold an imagination that in any given classroom, you could have students whose families had been profiled um, on, kind of for their religious, for, their, for the visibility of their religion and students who nobody even knew that they were Muslim, right? And what did they need to, to kind of see and hear um, to find themselves in this curriculum? And so um, we, you know, I think probably most of you are familiar with Rudin Sims um, Bishop's 1990s, um, work on windows, mirrors, and sliding doors, because that's really what this project aimed to do, um, you know, offering windows into other people's experiences, the broader world, um, mirrors through which students of all kind of backgrounds, right, um, would affirm and explore their own identities, and sliding doors that would build um, experience, empathy, and interest between these. So methods, right, methods were really important to this. Um, we did this kind of with this two, these two, two foundational pieces that we've been playing around with at Brooklyn Historical Society um, for a long time. And one was deep listening, right? How the best parts about history work is building empathy, is actually being changed by evidence, by new things that you hear and learn. Like how refreshing is that to, to get to change your mind about something and, and have your mind blown. Um, and so with deep listening, we, um, you know, thought a lot about the types of um, stories, right, and like worked with Zahir on to think about who would be interviewed, um, but also what prepares you to listen more deeply maybe than you do on a daily basis. And Alex is going to kind of speak more to how that plays out um, in a moment. But this is... Um, the other piece of this was really learning by doing, right? And in this case, by making art. 
and just echoing the points that Zahir already made about the special maybe synergies between an artistic practice and oral history as art. Um, you know, there's something that's very liberating and future oriented about both that you're not you're not listening to an oral history to like check off the box of the the, the fact or the evidence for your um, you know, for your test. You're not listening for the order of events of what happened first, right? That's against that linearity. People get memory, people's memories are like wrong, right? They're, but their experience is not, their analysis of it is not. And um, same with artists, right? You're not going to a, a work of art to find kind of, you know, what happened in this year. And, but it provokes in you connections. Um, it might show you how, while the facts of your life and somebody else's life are completely different, there's some truth that you share. Um, these are kind of the big, the big things that, that motivated and kept us going. And so we felt that it would be really important to, um, to really provide a, a, a lot of support to the curriculum in the work of an artist um, and teaching artist so that it could be all these things at once. Um, so, we worked with Camila Janan Rashid, who's an um, amazing artist who has a long kind of practice involving text and archives with visual art. Um, and before bringing her in, right? So that we, because you can't predetermine what you ask an artist to do also, which was, I think maybe we tried to for a second and then realized how wrong it was to try to do that. Um, and how wonderful it was that she was gonna work with us in ways that we hadn't even imagined yet. Um, so that's kind of what I wanted to share with you about from the, the guideposts of us as uh, museum educators coming to this in partnership with Zahir and, um, and I'll toss it now to Alex, who is going to help us kind of see how it plays out in actual curriculum. Thanks so much. Hello, friends. <clears throat> wow, that was um, that was really good, guys. That was awesome. Um, my name is Alex. I am the manager for curriculum development at New York Public Library now. Um, so I have to rep my new my new space. Uh, I'm the manager for curriculum development in our brand new Center for Educators in Schools, which is so new we don't even have a website. But Charlie's going to share where you can go to find resources to plug into the New York Public Library's education resources. And I'm here today because I had the lucky job to come after Zaheer and Emily did all this incredibly thoughtful thinking and planning um, and figure out how to translate that into lesson plans and activities that you could do in the classroom. And so that's what we're gonna, we're gonna get to do right now. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about kind of how the things that Zaheer and Emily talked about ended up showing up in the final project. So I'm gonna just, I will walk us through the website a little bit here and then we will start to do some work. So I hope you all are, are ready to, to get active in the chat uh, in a moment. Okay. So how do you design a curriculum whose purpose is to normalize Muslim voices without reifying these stereotypical ideas of Muslims as the other? right? Muslims are so much alike all of us that we've created a curriculum called Muslims in Brooklyn. It was called them out specifically. How, do we do, how did we do that? So we back up to here and Emily talk about in terms of I, ideating the project helped us immensely. What we did was we, we wanted it also to be modular and accessible for teachers to use. We know teachers just pick it apart and grab what they need. So what we did was when we, when we thought about our lesson plans, we took a thematic approach. And here on the website here, I've navigated us to the teacher toolbox. And you can see we've kind of, um, where narrators are speaking about these universal experiences, but all of these experiences are inflected through their identities, one, right? One of them is Muslim, but they also carry many other identities with them. So we have, the best neighborhood where Linda Sarsour talks about New York City and Sunset Park being the best neighborhood in New York and she describes her experience growing up there. Um, and we do that for, for each of our lessons here. I am going to demonstrate how take one of these 
and then use it for a completely different purpose than what I intended it for, which is to do to support civics learning here. So we are going to jump in. So we can, this is also, you know, we're trying to figure out how, to, how can you learn yourself? All right, self -directed. we're going to go to the meet the narrators page here and we're here today we're going to meet Ahmed Nasser. <clears throat> so the topic of today is how do, can we use the archives to foster civic engagement. First thing we're going to do is just take share in the chat. Uh, Ahmed Nasser's transcript of his oral history and his biography. We'll take a second to just read that on your own. Should take just a moment. You can scan it. And when you've finished, or maybe even as you're going, please drop in some chat, some reactions to it, something that resonates with you, some way of connecting to it. What are you thinking when you Let's clip this transcript? And my background is a classroom teacher, so I, I can sit here in silence until we get all night, until I get more. <laughs> Thank you, Chelsea. So Liz is saying, connecting with some phrases, this is home, this is where I changed my life, that deep love of Brooklyn. Chelsea made me think about my own story of moving to Brooklyn, about what is home. Aaron is coming in with the idea of photos to recall those first feelings arriving here. Yasmin, yeah, growing up here, agreeing that Brooklyn is home. Angela, thank you, Angela. I relate to the love for Brooklyn, always feeling like home, a, a place of great opportunity and diversity.
Hmm. Thank you, Jody Ann. Um, appreciate having grown up in New York City, not taking it for granted. <laughs> Hope makes me think about my family who moved out of Brooklyn and tries to get me to leave, but I want my own children to have the similar experience I have being raised in Brooklyn. There's nothing like it. Some Brooklyn pride here, which of course we have to rep. I am of course from Staten Island though, and I'm coming to you tonight from Staten Island. So I would be remiss if I didn't shout out my own borough. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you all. Um, one of the things that's unique about oral history is this orality of it. And to hear when we were working teach about oral history, he was trying to help us understand how the oral history itself is a unique product of a conversation between two people. And then when you listen to it, you bring your own interpretation to it, interpretation to it. And how orality voice sounds and the way that they tell a story is as important as the text. So considering our initial reactions to the to the text, having just read it, I'm going to play the clip now. And then we're going to revisit our reactions. Like what new information, what new understandings do we get by listening to the oral history? You can follow along with the transcript. It will also play along here on my screen. Okay, the clip is about two and a half minutes long. So get comfortable. We'll listen through the clip. We'll give a pause and then you can drop thoughts in the chat. When I first got to Brooklyn, uh, obviously we had to drive from JFK through East New York and uh, back in the 80s, East New York was not what it looks like now. So in my head, I'm, I'm imagining the beautiful city, New York, the Statue of Liberty, and we greet you as soon as you get to the airport. So we drove through East New York and I seen burned down houses and, and I was saying to my family, what is, this is New York, are you kidding me? This is not what I'm thinking, they said, yeah. Well, you, you get to see it. So we drove through Atlantic Avenue, Eastern Parkway, and eventually got downtown Brooklyn, and I was able to see the Twin Towers. I was like, oh, wow, this is what I came for. So that same day, believe it or not, I walked to the promenade, just down here, just to see that view. And it was an amazing sight. I took some pictures, too. Um, uh, to be honest with you, I think, uh, Brooklyn is home for me in a lot of ways. And when I think back, I don't know why I'm choking. <laughs> I know why. <clears throat> I think when I first came here, uh, even though it was with well, <clears throat> I used to think, you know, I'm going to be working here for a couple of years, I'll get my education, make my money, then leave. Didn't take this uh, too bad. <clears throat> wow. I guess I love Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, I mean, I, I look at it like really more, more than home. Um, <sighs> so when I met my wife, this is what I had my. This is what I lived most of my life. Uh, I think Brooklyn is uh, is home for me, and uh, I think it's going to continue to be home even when I retire. Brooklyn is part of us, as we are part of it, and I wish the best for Brooklyn. That's how I see it. Oh. Oh, revisit the chat. How was listened to it? What new information did you hear? 
Does anything change or resonate with you now that you've heard the narrator's voice? Yeah. Aaron says the emotion and love was even stronger this time around. Chada says, sounds like he was getting emotional. He gets choked up. I get choked up when I listen to it. I, it's... Liz says, I heard his emotions more, it made him connect even more to the same phrases as before. Thank you all for participating in the chat here. Angela, oh wow, I did feel his love through the text, but hearing him was very touching and shows how much it meant for him to build his life in Brooklyn. And the emotion of his voice was really connecting to his story, which was beautiful. Thank you, Charlie. <clears throat> Heard a personal journey occurred throughout, like it was revealing to himself how he felt. And that's a really powerful observation that through that narrative, you discover, you tell a story about yourself. So this kind of demonstrates the power and uniqueness of oral history as a source. When we think about learning history through newspaper articles or letters, you know, one of the things that you really can't hear is that orality, that intentionality behind what the uh, person is thinking and feeling. So I'm gonna ask, you know, how might this clip support your civic learning? What kind of connections to this idea of civic participation do you hear or see reflected in Abba Nasser's clip here? I have some thoughts too, but I want to just get from y'all first. <laughs> think about your context, your classroom. What are you thinking? You know, how might you go use this with your students? So here, Emily, you guys could jump in here too to help uh, help our friends out here. Shirley, thank you, Shirley, using the clip to introduce people in the community. Ooh, I like that, Chelsea. Chelsea says, we're starting a narrative writing unit, starting with oral storytelling, can help them organize their thoughts and stories. before writing their stories down. Absolutely. Um, my background is in special education, so I'm all about giving that time for processing, processing space. Tributing, I heard the way that belonging is built over time and experiences. He became a Brooklynite, not through a piece of paper, but by meeting his wife, living here. I had that same thought too. There's like a a unit in sixth grade that's like becoming a citizen and it's like talks about the citizenship test. You know, I don't think Abba Nasser became a citizen. I don't think he sees himself becoming a citizen because he passed the citizenship test. Liz says, I might want to show students the same New York City views described and discuss the views that matter to us, make us feel like we're home. 
I love that. That's so cool. Yasmin says, acknowledge that every student is different and allowing them to see this video can help them write their own stories. We love that. Want them to become their own authors. And Zaheer says, I also heard about the ways we experience the built environment, how our life experiences make meaning of place. I love this. So there are a lot of ways into and out of this oral history clip can be used to introduce all of these subjects. And I think as we think about civic learning and what kind of we want students to understand, um, to me, I, I really see this as, as kind of that, that idea of citizenship, of home, of how you become a person in a new place. You know, I think one of the things that I learned as I've, I've studied this clip and, and listened to it quite a few times, is that go back and read the bio for a moment. So Ahmed was born in 1966 um, and he came in 86. So he was 20. He did all of his primary schooling in another country. But Brooklyn is his home. Uh, he joined the NYPD in 2001. And when you listen to the oral history again, when he says the words, the Twin Towers, you can hear as that's when he first starts to kind of choke up. And think about how his relationship between his work and his experience in 2001 and how he, he came to be. So we've all heard different things. We're all bringing our own stories to these oral histories, as well as surfacing what's in these oral histories. And so now we're going to get to create a little bit of art, uh, which takes a little bit of work in the virtual environment. In the physical environment, this is exceptionally easy. We print out this transcript, we hand you black markers, and we ask you to create a blackout poem. We're going to do this online. And as we create the blackout poem, I'd like you to think about kind of an emotion, a feeling, something that you'd like to express through Ahmed Nasser's words. I think it's useful to think uh, in, in that kind of Emily's phrasing of, are, is this, are you going to make a poem that's a mirror? Where do you, what do you see yourself? Is it going to be a, a, a door? Or was it the mirror and the window? What do you see? What do you see from in, what do you understand Ahmed is saying? That's what we'll do. So first thing we're going to, well, Let's see what you would do first. First, I will show you. It's a little bit complicated online, but it is, it's ultimately very cool. With this Blackout Poetry Maker, Charlie, could you share the Blackout Poetry Maker text and then the Google Doc? And I'll walk us through and we'll do it, uh, we'll do it step by step. So you're going to need the text, which you can see on my screen share here. And you're going to select it all and you're going to control C, copy. And then you're going to visit the Blackout Poetry Maker, which is here. And you're going to paste the text onto the left-hand side where it says Custom Text. Paste, and then hit Enter. And now this center, thank you, Emily, Windows, Mirrors, Sliding Doors. So you've copied come over here, paste it into the custom text field, and then hit enter text. And now we've got Ahmed's words in this box. So you're going to click on the words that you want to remain visible. So just as a quick example, we'll go Brooklyn, New York looks beautiful. And then hit blackout. We're going to create our poems. Then this website also allows us to download them. And then we're going to upload them onto a Padlet so that we can see everyone's poems. But let's just take a moment to create our own poems using this format. Create them, black them out, and then just hang out and 
I'll walk us through the next steps so that we can see everyone's poems and we can have a moment to discuss and debrief. And I guess you'll get, you'll get to watch me create my poem, which is a little bit revealing, but I'm okay. So excited to see everyone's poems. So we just pause where you are. Um, when you're finished, you wanna hit scroll down to the bottom underneath the, the blackout text and hit render full text. That's gonna create this cool image of your poem, which you can right click, save as, My personal files here. No. Save it on your computer. And Charlie, can you share the Padlet? Great. Now you can drag and drop or upload your, your downloaded file onto the Padlet. Publish. There you go. Great. So once you've you've finished with your poem, render full text, save it to your computer, and then upload it to the pad. We'll give everyone a little bit of time. If you finish, we can go and read other folks' poems.
you have a question, of course, feel free to drop it in the chat. Thank you, everyone. Loving these poems. You click on one, you can, it'll pull up and you can see. So at this point, I'd like to open it up to everyone. So here, Emily, Shirley, jump in. And our participants too, of course. And in the chat, kind of share, what was this experience like for you? What are you seeing in these poems? What was the process of thinking through how to express yourself using someone else's words. Oh, I'm sorry, Angela, what happened? <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read some so that when they share this recording, that they're, they're there for posterity. So here, in my beautiful, in my head, the beautiful city, liberty greets you as you get burned down and family is not what we got, Brooklyn. Wow, this is not, a, just prove, you know, I'm gonna be working. First, obviously, East New York, imagining the beautiful city. It greets you through East New York. This is New York? See Atlantic Avenue, Eastern Parkway, and downtown Brooklyn. Wow, this is what I came for. I think Brooklyn is home for me. Liz is saying she sees the words I didn't notice at first. Liberty greets you on someone else's. Yeah, words. That's lovely. Thank you, Zahir. Zahir says, each of these poems represent to me a different listening, honing in on certain words as an anchor. To Liz's point, what stands out to one person might sound different to another. That's right. And that inflection that I give when I perform the poem is that other layer of interpretation here. Okay. So this is our arc. We've thought about oral history as a source. We've seen the kind of unique perspectives that it can give you through the layering of to text and the orality of the actual speech. And then we've taken it and made it our own and made our own understandings, our own expressions through it. And in that way, we've built empathy and we've beginning to think more about what does it mean to be home? What does it mean to be a part of a thing? Um, and how does that happen? I'll just leave with a little bit more about the website. One of the things that we do in each of our lessons is we offer that blackout poetry, which is something that's very easily to do in a virtual classroom using digital tools like this one. And if you're in a physical classroom, you have the option of also doing collage poetry. 
these are images from teacher workshops that we did at Brooklyn Historical Society in the before times um, when we had large in-person gatherings where we gave teachers the opportunities to take the oral history transcripts and create collage poetry or blackout poetry, their, their choice. Here's some of the poems. This, uh, this image on the left is a, uh, from an oral history that we named a unicorn in all the spaces. On the right, it's just a very brief kind of po snippets of text cut out and put together. This is another example. Yeah, I love the unicorn too. Mwah, perfect. Here's another little piece of collage art using narrator's words to talk about Salat. These are actually Shahana Hanif. Uh, both Shahana Hanif and Muhammad Fayez play large roles in this curriculum. They have incredible clips that we used. Um, this is Shahana talking about how the gender difference between her and her brothers uh, played out in her family. So please explore the website in addition to lesson plans, which kind of run through a sequence of activities that we hope get your students to a level of understanding. There are additional resources here. Um, we commissioned Dr. Donna Austin to provide some essays to provide additional context that we think teachers might use while they're teaching. Um, for example, there are a number of clips that mention uh, Black American Islam. So there's a little primer here. It's appropriate for teachers, probably for high school students if you wanted students to read them as well a little bit of contextual information. Oh no, our timeline is down. So what happens when you build many sites? Uh, is that also true for these guys? No, these are great. So you can kind of, these are self-exploration. You can kind of, we've followed the Muslims in Brooklyn ethos of tying clips to place and you can follow them through. And then if you wanna go by narrators and share photos, portraits where available, clips. We hope that this brings a lot of joy to you and your students in their classrooms. Um, and I can't wait to, to hear from you. And uh, Shirley, I'm gonna to toss it back to you, I think. Although I think I wanna just read out these, what, what ended up in the chat here. Emily wrote, there's a bold interpretive element to these projects. There's nothing wrote about them. And that's part of what it means to join in a historical conversation, not just about citing evidence, but activating your meaning making muscles with that evidence and primary sources. Thank you, Emily. All right. Sure. Thank you. We'll Thank you, Alex. You. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Zahir. This was wonderful. I'd also like to mention that because I also was at Brooklyn Historical Society. We actually used this as part of a school program entitled Muslims in Brooklyn. And one of the things that I found to be really interesting was we did have a group of Muslim girls and they were able to listen to some of the oral histories as they went through when we had an exhibit as well as looking at the oral histories. And what I found most fascinating was they discovered how other Muslims broke fast and how they also celebrated their various holidays and how they did um, the same things they did, but a little bit differently. Apparently, these some of these ladies thought that everyone did everything the same because they knew because they knew their cohort of, of of the Muslim community, and it was really interesting. One girl, one girl was was sitting there saying wait a minute, hold it. I use dates and water to break my fast. This girl's eating peas and rice and arroz con pollo. Wait a minute, this is different. And it was really eye-opening and fascinating. And for me, it was fascinating because I was able to see a different side of, of a culture that I know I have friends, but I get to see different parts. And using the blackout poetry, 
this, um, high school students had a, really had a lot of fun with it because they all were able to make meaning with to themselves with all of it. Okay. So I was just wondering if I could just um, open it up. Do we have any other questions, comments, thoughts, ideas? Uh, uh, Shirley, I really like that story because that emphasized something that I know Emily and I talked about and Emily touched upon, which was who is the audience for this project? And um, we were very conscious that there are Muslim students in these classrooms so that mm -hmm. we are not, we're doing a project that is not just educating non-Muslim students, but Muslim students as well. And so when we do this kind of inclusive curriculum, it's really important to not do it in a way that transmits or communicates to the students who are part of that curriculum, that mm -hmm. you are not considered part of the classroom. That's why you're part of the curriculum of the other that we're teaching to your class. And so I think it's beautiful that the students had that experience, which demonstrates the value of conceiving of the students themselves, uh, people from the community as being part of the instructional audience for, for this project. It really was because a lot of the students were able to, I kid you not, Zahir and Emily, they were walking asking questions, um, sorry, 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 the non-Muslim non students were now asking questions of the Muslim students and they were getting to, beginning to really understand with them and they were, they were, some of them were able to say, you know something, we do something similar, but it's not that we do this. And the dialogue they were able to have was really empowering. Okay, well, I'd like to say thank you again to, Emily, to Zahir Ali, Emily Potter Ninjai, and Alex Tronalone for participating with us today. Um, thank you so much. We appreciate you taking the time to join us in the first of our series on Muslims in Brooklyn. If you enjoyed today's sessions, we hope you'll consider joining us for future education workshops with the Center for Brooklyn History. Our next Muslims in Brooklyn workshop is on December 8th from 4 to 5.30 p.m. Listening as a, um, using oral histories in the classroom with Dr. Habiba Noor, who is the other author and curriculum writer of Muslims in Brooklyn. Um, please look in our chat for the workshop link. Um, and the last workshop in our Muslims in Brooklyn series will be January 12th, which will feature newly elected city council member Shahana Hani in conversation with Zahir Ali. Um, if you're looking for a way to virtually support project-based learning and research in your classrooms during remote learning, uh, consider having your students participate in this year's New York City History Day. The Center for Brooklyn History is the proud host of this year's virtual contest. And we're partnering with cultural institutions around the city and state to support New York City students and educators who are interested in participating. As a matter of fact, tomorrow night, we are hosting an info session at 5.30, which is free. Please feel free to join us. Finally, I'd like to conclude with an urgent request to please fill out our short survey about your experience attending today's event. As we navigate the virtual world, I can sincerely say your feedback will directly impact the way we offer future PLs. The survey is also your key to CTLE credit. Those seeking credit will receive an option at the end of the survey to enter their details for this purpose. Only those that fill out the survey will receive credit. I repeat, only those that fill out the survey will receive CTLE credit. Those that request should keep their eyes peeled for a digital confirmation for your CTLE credit within the next week. On behalf of Brooklyn Public Library Center for Brooklyn History, I would like to thank you again for attending and we hope to see you soon. Thank you, friends. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Shirley. You. Thanks to hear Alex and everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good to see you all. Good to see you. Bye, friends.